And I think it's important to point out that no person is sent to hell for one particular sin. No, it's because we're lost. Because hell at its core is a place where God is not. It is separation from God and all of his goodness, all of his grace, all of his mercy. If sin is us saying, God, I'm in control, leave me alone, hell is God saying, okay. When I was a kid, I was terrified of hell because I thought that hell was this giant torture chamber. And that's where Satan was and all the demons. And they got a hold of you and they tortured you for all of eternity. Have y'all, did y'all ever get that concept of hell? Sadly, most of what we know about hell doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from literature. We would base it off that. In fact, for example, there's this painting. And um, I uh, thought I had this memorized, but let me get this. It was from 1431 by Angelico Giovanni. And it's called The Last Judgment. And you can see up there that uh, Christ is judging the world and you have the saints and they're all dressed and it's a beautiful thing and it's wonderful. But if you look in the, in the left-hand corner here, this was hell. And you notice how they're all naked and they're all being tortured. But look who's torturing them. It's Satan and his demons. Yeah, you don't want that in your kid's room, okay? <laughs> but did you know that Satan is not in hell. Satan does not control hell. In fact, hell was created for Satan's judgment. Matthew 25, verse 41 says this, that he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was created to hold Satan in judgment. At the end of all things. We were not created to be there. We were created for the earth. But when we deny God, we follow that path. Also, hell is not this big, gigantic party. How many of y'all have heard people excited and say, Ha I'll see you there, you know? That's not how it works. So, who goes to hell and Why? Well, for that, we're going to dive into our text and look at this passage. But quickly, the context of this passage is not simply about hell. It's also about how your life choices impact where you go and how you treat others. It's also a count of the Pharisees. Now, now Jesus had all these accounts of Pharisees. And in Luke chapter 16, verse 14, it says, The Pharisees who love money heard about all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. Jesus is talking to Pharisees, and he's trying to get this idea because they believe in the resurrection. They believe in afterlife, but they thought they were a shoe-in. They thought that they could behave any way they wanted here on the earth, and they were okay because they were Abraham's descendants. And it didn't matter how they treated the poor. It didn't matter how they did things. All that mattered was they were Abraham's ascendants. So their faith did not match up where they said they were going to spend eternity. And so that's why Jesus tells this parable to them. So let's look at this again. Look at verse 19. It says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, if you were to ask the Pharisees which of these men were blessed by God, they would automatically say, the rich man. Why? How can you tell? He's rich. He's got all the things of this world. Of course God's favor is upon him. And who was cursed? Lazarus, why? Look at his life. But Jesus is going to flip all that upside down. And he says, it's not as you think. Now, something about this passage I think is interesting. It says that the beggar's name was Lazarus. But we don't know the rich man's name. He's never named. Why is that? Could it be that his identity was in that he was a rich man? Oftentimes, when we push God away and we fall into sin, that sin takes on its own identity and begins to consume us to where our identity is in that. Not in God, but in that one thing. And for this man, it was this, this, that he was a rich man. 
But his life came to an end. Look at verse 22. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Now both men died, but notice it doesn't end with a period. They died and. Death is not the end. And both these men ended up going to different places. Their life continued beyond the grave, but where did they go? One went to a place called Abraham's bosom, and, and, and we say Abraham's side, Abraham's bosom. Uh, it's basically synonymous with heaven. You hear paradise, you hear other terms, and it just means close to God. It's where there is joy, where there is peace, where there is love, there is grace, there is mercy. It, it's with God. And the other man, the rich man, went to hell. Now, there's two Greek words used for hell. One is Hades, and the other is Kihana. And, and both words are actually used in this passage. But both become synonymous with hell, and it's a place where it's filled with agony. But one of the things I think is important for us to clarify is that why did this rich man go to hell? It wasn't because he was rich. And it, was be, it wasn't because he didn't treat Lazarus with money. He didn't help him. It was because he was lost. How he lived his life was just a symptom of the fact that he was lost. It wasn't the reason why he was sent to hell. It was the revelation that he was lost. And I think it's important to point out that no person is sent to hell for one particular sin. It's not like if you do that, boom. No, it's because we're lost. And it says here in the passage, he went to a place of torment. Now, I want you to think about the language that is used in the Bible to describe what hell is. There is eternal darkness. There is flames. Now, think about how those contradict each other. There is weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is the worm that never dies. Now, these are all earthly descriptions as a way to describe something that cannot be described. John Calvin used to say that God will use worldly understandings as a way to describe things. So like when he describes heaven, our minds can't comprehend how beautiful and glorious heaven is. So whatever the Bible says about it uses human words, but it's so much greater that we can't begin to comprehend. But the same is true of hell. That it's so much worse than we could ever begin to imagine. But he says in agony, why? Because hell at its core is a place where God is not. It is separation from God and all of his goodness, all of his grace, all of his mercy. If sin is us saying, God, I'm in control, leave me alone, hell is God saying, okay. Okay. But you don't get to have my presence. You don't get to have all the things that come with me if you want me to leave you alone. Compare to this. This is how, how it was explained, explained to me one time. Um, imagine you were born in a cave, and you lived in a cave, and it was like a nice, cool 50 degrees. You had a river running through the cave. It was nice. You had little mushrooms grew, and they, you ate them. It was wonderful. And everything was, was beautiful. You never saw the sun. And so when someone said, hey, there's a sun out there that helps provide all this. And you said, I've never seen the sun. I don't believe in the sun. I got it made right here. Who needs the sun? I don't believe in it. I wish the sun would just leave me alone and go away. What would happen if the sun went away to your beautiful little cave? Without the sun, your little cave is not 45, 50 degrees. It is, what, 3,000 below zero? <laughs> Everything's frozen. It's eternal darkness. It's all gone. Because even though you said you didn't need that, you did. Sometimes we don't understand that even, even non-believers get to receive God's grace while we're here on this earth. The blessings, as Jesus said, his mercy falls on both the righteous and the unrighteous. We get to experience all that goodness. But in hell, God 
removes himself and everything that comes with him. Why? Because we ask him to. C.S. Lewis said that hell is the greatest monument to human freedom ever made. He says this, let me quote him. He says, to those who object to hell, he says, what do you want God to do? Wipe out their past sins and give them a fresh start? He did that on Calvary. To forgive them, they will not be forgiven. To leave them alone, yes, I'm afraid, he says, and that is what he does. Hell is not God sending people there. No, people refuse God's grace and they don't want to be with him. And so again, C.S. Lewis, what he says is that in the end, there are two types of people that exist. One to whom, God's, to whom they say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. You say to God, I don't want you. And God says, okay. Now that, that we say, well, how awful is that? But it's really a loving thing. Could you imagine if God forced himself upon us against our will? Now, I want to show you an il illustration, and this morning I did that with my daughter, Sav. My Sav is not here for this service. So today, playing the part of Savannah Robinson is Amy Novelli. So let's welcome Amy up here. <laughs> okay, I want you to pretend that Amy is my daughter, Okay. And, and, and I've tried everything I can to share my love with her and to get her to love me. I've given her every blessing, but she can't stand me. So, and, and I try to love on her, and she, she won't let me. She's like, get away from me. Ah, you're the worst ever. I wish you would just go away. <laughs> and say, oh, I can't stand you so much. Leave me alone. And I try to tell her, I love you. I'm your dad. I, I want to bless you. Come, enjoy all these things. And she keeps pushing me away. She wants nothing to do with me, okay? And it's not just like she's like indifferent to me. She can't stand me. And so imagine what it would be like if I say, okay. And I'm not going to hug you like this sad. I'm going to like, <laughs> yes, saint, yes saint, um, sanctuary saint. But imagine if I grab her and I say, I don't care what you want. You're going to spend all eternity with me, whether you like it or not. Come with me. And she's like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Now, what would you say about me if, if that's what I'm forcing upon her? You'd say, well, that's so unloving, forcing her against her will. Well, imagine if I did that, or, or, or what I could do is say, well, here, let me just magically make you love me. Boom. Then she's no longer Amy. She's not what made her hers. So hell is God respecting us. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> but you all see how, how hell is God respecting our free will. We say, leave me alone. And God says, okay. Okay. 